In the first half of the 1970s, Stevie Wonder produced a run of albums the like of which, the consistent quality of which, the audacity of which, and the sweeping innovation of which, have never most likely been approached by any artist over such a long run of recordings. Some see it as some kind of commercial Midas touch developed with long experience, others as a spirit of freedom from Motown's crushing regimen, which brought out his best. While the first may be true, it has to be noticed that the elements which made this run were being put together as far back as 1966 with Stevie's Down to Earth album. But when he signed his new Motown contract in 1971, which gave him a much improved royalty rate, freedom from Motown's production machine and ownership of his own masters, he was set up to commence a run of six albums that were almost too good to change music, because the best they could do was spawn imitators for none could surpass them. Born Stephen Hardaway in Saginaw, Michigan in 1950, blind since shortly after birth due to over-oxygenation in a ventilating chamber, Stevie was born six weeks premature. His family, a knotty, complicated, self-mythologizing beast in itself, moved to Detroit when he was four, when Stephen first sang in public in his Baptist church. Growing up scuffling and singing on the streets, Wonder was discovered by Ronnie White of The Miracles. White was the baritone, and he's the only original member of The Miracles still in the group. Already adept at piano, harmonica and drums, Barry Gordy, who I don't think is half the genius people make him out to be, instantly saw a blind kid who played piano and thought, hello, Ray Charles. While his mother was changing his legal name to Stephen Morris, Clarence Paul, who was possibly very much more the genius than people make him out to be, was changing his name for the rest of the world to Little Stevie Wonder. His first albums were floundering efforts, a Ray Charles tribute and a jazz instrumental set, and at age 12, Gordy sent Wonder out on the legendary Motortown Review, touring what would later be known as the Chitlin Circuit, a phrase that was coined in the 1970s after the circuit had all but disappeared, but was more correctly known as the Toba or as Ma Rainey called it, Tough on Black Asses circuit. At the Regal Theatre in Chicago, Wonder recorded a spontaneous jam called Fingertips. So spontaneous was it that the bass player could be heard hollering, what's the key? What key? in the background. Which hit number one for three weeks, making Wonder the youngest ever holder of a number one single on an album. Michael Jackson later broke the record for a number one single, but Wonder still holds the album record. At the time, Wonder was being paid $2.50 a week by the label, the rest going into trust until he turned 21. By the mid-60s though, Wonder hadn't had any more substantial hits, and his voice was changing, and Gordy had to be talked out of dropping him by Sylvia Moy, who worked with Wonder to come up with Uptight, thus saving his neck. The follow-up, Down to Earth, saw Wonder's voice become richer and showing what he'd learned from being schooled by great singers, particularly Dennis Edwards and Marvin Gaye. His next record, I Was Made to Love Her, stepped into classic soul territory. There was a lot of guff and filler on the record, but the closer, Every Time I See You I Go Wild, really introduces the classic Stevie Wonder voice. 1967 and 68 saw much Motown tomfoolery as they tried to wring a hit out of Wonder, which he finally did with Shooby Dooby Da Day, or something like that, and For Once in My Life. Wonder played along because he knew that the long game was the way to go, namely wait it out until he turned 21 and go to shoot for a new record contract. One month before he turned 21, however, Wonder did fire that first shot across Motown's bow and released the first of what was to be his golden run of albums, Where I'm Coming From. There are a couple of yellow submarines on it, Take Up a Course in Happiness and I Want to Talk to You, but on this madly ambitious record, the highlights are the funk explosion of Do Yourself a Favour, the aching Never Thought You'd Leave in Summer and Think of Me as Your Soldier, and the wonder pop of If You Really Love Me and Look Around, a song the like of which had never been cut on Motown. 
Gordy didn't want a bar of it and it took one to threatening to void his contract when he turned 21 to twist Gordy's arm. This came out a couple of months after Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. In fact, the success of that record was probably some comfort to Gordy to try for a second lightning strike. Where I'm Coming From wasn't a hit peaking at number 62, but it was the making of one of the defining artists, if not the defining artist, of the next 10 years. Eleven months later, Wonder came out with The Music of My Mind, where he integrated the synth sounds from an experiment prog rock group, Tonto's expanding headband, as well as playing every other instrument himself, with the exception of a trombone part and guitar on the hit Superwoman. And, as much as the synths, it's the injection of Wonder's drumming that really defies these records of his own. Music of My Mind takes Wanda through his emotional day-to-day from the dreamy Superwoman, which is basically Never Thought You'd Leave in Summer from the last album, and I Love Every Little Thing About, to the frantic Keep On Running and the incipient malevolence of evil. It doesn't have the leap out and grab you songs, perhaps like Superstition or Higher Ground, but there's a unity of sound, the odd avenues that adventure leads us down, and the perfect balance of sunshine and shadows that marks this as a quite near-perfect album. Seven months later, Talking Book was released. This was the same skeleton as music of my mind, but broader, wilder, and crammed with the leap out and grab you songs. From the trippy love song, You Are the Sunshine of My Life, to the crackling Maybe Your Baby, my favourite on the album, the synth stravaganza of You've Got It Bad Girl, the pure classic soul of Blame It on the Sun, the evocative looking for another pure love with one of Jeff Beck's finest solos on it, and of course, the number one smash in Superstition. Talking book sprawls right across the map, swinging wildly between styles and approaches, and it's never less than thrilling at any time. Wonder's drumming is a marvel, especially on Superstition, where he lays down one of the greatest fatback tracks ever. Staggering as music of my mind was, Talking Book manages to exceed it in every way. Unbelievably, less than a year later, he was to similarly surpass even this. Inner Visions is one of my favorite records of all time, a top 10 easily. A lot of people prefer, with some considerable justification, songs in the key of life, but Inner Vision for me is perfect. A rare kind of perfect. A record to be put up on a pedestal. Stevie takes on the social wreckage of the failed 60s liberal agenda, the innocence devoured by drugs and war and sheer cupidity. He looks skeptically at the religion he grew up with and turns an eye inward and eastward. And he does it against the greatest bed of funk, jazz, electro noodling he ever cooked up. Again, his drumming drives it from rump shaking thumps to delicate jazzy touches to pop shuffles. But more than anything musical, it's his seamless vision of the world. The dissolution and tribulation of Too High, Mr. Know-It-All and the magnificent living for the city. The comforts and woes of love in Golden Lady, Don't You Worry About a Thing and All in Love is Fair and the spiritual journeys and affirmations of Visions, Jesus, Children of America, and Higher Ground. It also, for what it's worth, has a great album cover. I love this record so much that my alarm clock plays Higher Ground as its first tune on my wake-up playlist. This is where Stevie joined the all-time greats, and by this point, he was floating serenely above all of the competition. The fifth of the sixth is the problematic record in the collection, Fulfillingness's first finale. I tend to say this because it pales slightly to the two giants either side of it, but it's a quirky, agreeable record that is the sunnier obverse to Inner Visions. Led by the funky pair of hits You Haven't Done Nothing, which made number one, which features the Jackson 5, and Boogie On Reggae Woman, number three, Fulfillingness is a relationship record, rather so much than a social and spiritual observation one, like Inner Visions, and it's a warm and playful one at that. It's not to say he doesn't keep up the spiritual commentary. Heaven is ten zillion light years away and they won't go when I go. Can even be seen as a little bitter and high-handed. One might have expected something more conciliatory considering Wonder's miraculous escape from death in a car wreck at the end of 1973. He's far more magnanimous in matters of the heart, from creepin' to too shy to please don't go to it ain't no use and the rhythmically hypnotic next album foreshadowing Bird of Beauty. 
These songs get rich, warm vocals and sheeny production missing from Intervision's streetsy vibe, and they give the album a very distinctive counterpoint to the nittier and grittier stuff. This is the album where Stevie just does what he wants to do. It's warm, confident, and while it doesn't have the knockout flurry of hits that Intervision had, it's its own record and it shouldn't be neglected in your journey through Stevie's golden run. On fulfillingness, Stevie finally reached the point where he knew he could do anything he wanted. Across 1975 and 76, he asked himself the question, why can't I do everything I want? So he did, all on the same album. Songs in the Key of Life is a sprawling, madly eclectic, impossibly overcrowded, utterly, utterly brilliant double album plus EP covering the entire scope of black music and is unafraid to address the social concerns the same way that Intervisions did. Wonder steps back from his one-man band policy that he used on the other five albums, using over 120 musicians on the albums. And while he's still very much the focus of proceedings, the album introduces brilliant and free to play between jamming musicians that Wonder had never had. The result of this staggering diversity it produces is that the album has no boundaries, no barriers, no impediment to the message and the groove. But it also draws the record out, particularly on sides three and four, on songs that sound a little bloated with it. The album is a gargantuan expanse and you simply have to surrender to the ocean of it. You'll never ever get it all in one sitting. There are too many amazing moments to list, but some highlights of the two opening cuts, Love's In Need Of Love Today and Have A Talk With God, both of which are winning melodies and irresistible earworms. Village Ghetto Land is next and it's probably the weakest cut on the album. I Wish is a stunning and warm recollection of childhood. The wormy and winding melody of Knocks Me Off My Feet is priceless, while Pastime Paradise is an artful message song aimed at the new generation of black millionaires who've forgotten where they've come from and who they're left behind. Album 2 features longer, more exploratory songs, but still takes time for a pop slammer in Isn't She Lovely. The soulful ballad, Joy Inside My Tears, talks frankly about Stevie's gratitude for the forces, his new wife, his faith, his friends who brought him through the the aftermath of that terrible car crash, everything involved in the process of rebuilding and recovering, and it might just be my favourite song on the record. All Day Sucker, which would have been on the EP, is wicked funk all off Kelder and full of sci-fi sound effects and nasty, nasty singing and is great fun. The album finishes as it began with a calm and meditative grace on the instrumental harmonica showcase Easy Going Evening. Is this, as some claim, the greatest album ever made? It might be, but I find it hard to make that call. Like all double albums, a single album of Love's In Need Of Love Today, Have A Talk With God, I Wish, Pastime Paradise, All Day Sucker, Sir Duke, Isn't She Lovely, Knocks Me Off My Feet, As, Joy Inside My Tears and Easy Going Evening, would match in a visions. As is, I think, the virtues of discipline and singularity of vision. And I think Songs in the Key of Life is an unmatched outpouring of brilliance in any one place or time. The album has more minutes of great music on it than any other album, but it's just too big for me. It's like chocolate cake, tasty by the spoonful, but too rich as a whole. Stevie's run came undone with his next album, the decidedly odd journey through the secret life of plants, which considered of noodly music. It was, after all, conceived as a film soundtrack and then has had new songs added to it in order to try to sell a few copies, and swathes of lyrical psychobabble. He still had one great album left in him, 1980's Hotter Than July, which might show you what a concise Songs in the Key of Life would have been like. And thereafter, he drifted into a comfortable world of MOR number ones and an increasing interest in exploring his African heritage. Hip hop utterly left him behind, and he became a bit of an artist where the fans would buy enough albums to keep him in a contract. But now Stevie is starting to outlive his fan base. I doubt somehow he's short of a dollar though. The royalties on the utterly putrid I just called to say I love you would send his great 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 grandkids through college and pay to get their teeth fixed. But these were great days. 
that half decade when Stevie Wonder made record after record that woke up the world to a new and tricky set of musical possibilities. It's the greatest arc of career evolution over so short a time in the history of Western music, I believe. It's the greatest story ever told, much better than I can tell it. They said there'd be signs and wonders, but in the end, they only needed one wonder.